Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II at the Trooping the Colour ceremony held every year in London on the Queen's birthday. The Queen's colour is paraded. The regiments of guards march by wearing their famous hats made of bearskin. Here come the household cavalry, looking very splendid in their shining helmets. The Queen takes the salute as the soldiers pass. The holiday for the Queen's birthday is this month. Actually, her birthday is not in June, it's really April the 21st. But it's a tradition to celebrate the British monarch's birthday in June, a tradition that has never been changed. Queen Elizabeth is head of the British Commonwealth of Nations a group of countries in nearly every continent of our world. And for some of them, like Australia, New Zealand and Canada, she is their queen as well. Have you ever thought what the queen does? What it means for her to be queen of Australia? The queen is only a figurehead. She has very little power of her own. The parliament elected by the people rules the country. The things done in the queen's name are really done by the parliament and she will never act against its wishes. This is what we call a limited monarchy. The Queen is consulted when a new Prime Minister or Parliament is needed, and she signs the acts passed by Parliament before they become laws. Queen Elizabeth visits the countries of the Commonwealth when she can, and takes part in ceremonies and important functions. The Australian coat of arms is floodlit on Parliament House, Canberra, and the Queen is arriving for an evening reception. The then Prime Minister, Sir Robert Menzies, and his wife, Dame Patty, welcome her on behalf of the Members of Parliament. Up the steps and into King's Hall, where hangs the painting of the Queen opening our Parliament during her 1954 visit. During the reception, Sir Robert Menzies speaks. He must have said something very nice. And now the Queen takes the opportunity to speak to the Prime Minister and leaders of our nation while she is in Australia with them. Other members of the royal family visit us too. The Queen Mother is patron of the Adelaide Festival of Arts. Princess Alexandra enjoyed a holiday here. And this young man spent a time at school near Melbourne and returned to represent his mother at the memorial service for Mr. Holt last December. Prince Philip often seems to fly in and out. But because the royal family lives in England and the Queen cannot often be in the other Commonwealth countries, she appoints in each a Governor General to carry out her duties for her. Here, at the annual graduation ceremony at the Royal Military College at Duntroon near Canberra, Lord Casey takes the salute. The outstanding cadet of the year is presented with the sword of honour by the Governor-General. These cadets will be commissioned as army officers by the Queen. But does all this explain why we still have a Queen's birthday holiday and not a Prime Minister's birthday holiday? Here are some ideas which might help a discussion for your classroom. Does the Queen remind us that many of us had great-grandfathers who came from Britain? Perhaps we enjoy the old-fashioned romance of kings and queens, the ceremonies, rich robes and prancing horses, things our members of Parliament can't give us. Think a bit about this word. Tradition. Do some of us feel a real affection for the royal family and take an interest in what they're doing? Does having a queen give us a framework and general rules inside which we can run our country without the risk of sudden changes? This arrangement doesn't get upset each election day when there could be a new prime minister or parliament. When he was here a few weeks ago to attend a study conference, Prince Philip 
said that he thought the monarchy was always changing to fit the times. He thinks it is a sensible way of having a head of Commonwealth and is a link between countries like Australia, New Zealand and Canada because they have the same Queen. And now for our next topic, let's turn to the sea. Even for modern ships, strong and powerful as they are, the rough and treacherous seas along the coastline of Western Australia are dangerous. They can be fatal if the ship is stranded aground on a reef. How much worse it must have been for sailing ships like the Endeavour when caught in a storm here. Ships made only of wood, only 80 feet long, weighing about 400 tonnes and in need of repairs after a four months voyage with no radio to call for help and no engine. Only the wind to rely on or to be afraid of. Imagine yourself up in the rigging in the middle of a 50-foot wave. Many of them didn't make it. In fact, the coastline all along Western Australia is littered with the wrecks of 18th century sailing ships, particularly the Dutch ones. They were caught in storms and blown onto the treacherous rocky cliffs. Now you might well say, yes, that's terribly sad, but what on earth were they doing there in the first place? Well, the Dutch East India Trading Company used to send ships from Holland around the coast of Africa to Indonesia, Malaya and India to buy and take back to Europe cloth, jewels and mainly spices. Now, once these ships rounded the Cape of Good Hope, the prevailing winds blew in a southwesterly direction. So they set their course for Australia and at the last moment turned back toward the East Indies. If, however, a storm blew up or the captain made a mistake in navigation, they could be swept onto the Australian coastline and wrecked. Part of the wreckage of a ship to which this very thing must have happened was found last month by a team of divers at the base of a 200-foot cliff at a spot about 400 miles north of Perth. The ship was the Zeitdorp, which came to grief in June 1712. It seems there were few survivors. Diving conditions are very dangerous because of the rough seas and jagged reefs. In fact, it's only possible to dive at this spot during one month of each year, the month of May. But when one of the divers was finally able to investigate the wreckage after waiting round for some days in this isolated spot, it must have been very exciting because he discovered, embedded in a reef about 10 feet by 5 feet, a large pile of treasure. No, I'm not kidding. It's true. He found old silver coins like this one, called a gilder. The ship must have been carrying them to pay for the spices. And the diver says there are about 100,000 of them just lying there. But hold it, no one quite knows how much they're worth. A museum curator said he didn't think they were worth anything at all. The diver, on the other hand, thinks that the silver content in the coins would be worth millions of dollars. Who knows? But let's imagine that the diver is right and the silver content is worth millions of dollars and the coins can be recovered. Who should get them? The government? Should it be given to the museums? Or should the diver get it? After all, he put in all the hard work. Well, you think about it and I'll tell you what the law says about it next week. Oh, and by the way, don't go sailing off the coast of Western Australia, particularly if, if you have some money in your pocket. You might end up as treasure. Now, on to another subject, students. Students aren't always the quiet, industrious scholars we imagine them to be. This demonstration was held by students at Berkeley College in America they were protesting against the Vietnam War. In France, student demonstrations like this started rioting which brought the country almost to a standstill. Opposition to the government in Japan led to violent clashes between students and specially trained riot police. 
and back in Europe, in West Berlin, ugly street fighting has continued between police and students. One of the largest demonstrations was staged at Grosvenor Square, London, in protest against the war in Vietnam. It developed into a vicious battle with police. Well, that's the picture in many parts of the world at the moment. In Europe alone, apart from Britain, France and Germany, other student demonstrations have been in the news. In Spain, in Belgium, in Italy, in Czechoslovakia, in Sweden and in Poland. But why should there be this wave of anger and violence amongst students in the world? Well, that's a very hard question to answer. So let's think about it. Students are young people between 6 to 12 years older than yourselves. They've left school and they've gone to college or university to further their career. It's a time in their lives when they're free from the restrictions of a school, and yet they don't have to answer to an employer. They're also at an age when they start asking questions about laws, about governments of the world, and about values. And they feel free to criticize them. Most of them were born during the war or just after. They grew up in an age free from world war, but in an age which saw the production of the atomic and hydrogen bombs. They're anxious to prevent another great war. And by demonstrations, many of them protest against the war in Vietnam. But not all student demonstrations are against the war in Vietnam. Often they're against government that's too strict, or one that won't help poor and underprivileged people. Students have protested, too, about the conditions under which they have to study. Many of Euro Europe's universities suffer from overcrowded classrooms and living accommodation. And students complain about poor lighting and heating and not enough money for textbooks. These conditions cause the outbreak of student violence in France. At the Sorbonne University in Paris, squads of riot police were called out when the demonstration started. The police and students clashed, and this was the result. Classrooms were wrecked and many police and students injured. Within two weeks, thousands of workers joined the students. France was close to civil war. President de Gaulle appeared on television. He said that the conditions of the students would be improved and promised the workers better wages. But he demanded that the demonstrations stop. However, the riots have continued. President de Gaulle is taking a firm stand and there have been many arrests, but the trouble is still going on. In West Germany, a similar wave of riots took place. The reasons here were different, but the demonstrations looked the same. The shooting of the communist student leader, Rudi Dutschka, triggered off wild rioting in Berlin. It gained many supporters for the young communist's flag. Dutschke did not die, but the attempted assassination caused Germany's most violent civil disturbances in 30 years. Well, since Australia became involved in Vietnam and conscription began, there have been many demonstrations in this country too. They're not as violent as those overseas, but they do form part of a worldwide student protest. Student leaders believe that by demonstrating they can win better conditions for themselves and for society. But how many students join in just for the excitement? Many demonstrations have developed into riots, and in the process people have been injured, laws broken, and governments disrupted. Is there a better way for students to express their beliefs? What do you think? Till next week, goodbye. <laughs>